<laughs> Are we ready? Then let us begin. Hello. Welcome to another episode of Torn Book Club. I am, as always, Josh Rubenstein, a.k.a. Saruman, your host. Uh, I'm flying solo today because uh, most Torn people are, are at Dragon Con this weekend. Um, other people are at other events. There's a lot going on this weekend, so I'm here by myself. But we've got a pretty uh, full chat going on, so that's good. Um, a lot of our regulars, Erevandi, Light of the King, I Stole the One Ring, Rovandir... Uh, who did I miss? Uh, Temple is here, and I also see that Rachel has joined us in the chat, um, who you might remember from our Sherlock Holmes episode. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm here. <laughs> so, uh, this weekend, uh, we're discussing, um, our book of the month for August, which is, uh, All Creatures great and small by james harriet and uh i have to say that when i announced this book last week or last month um it got probably the most enthusiastic response of almost any book of the month i've made or any book of the month uh i've talked about so um and big thank you to uh i stole the one ring for suggesting this book um uh, it, it is not one I would have chosen myself, but, um, and Rachel Brochner now exists with a name. Yay! <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, this is not a book that I would have, uh, suggested f myself. Um, it, it was certainly not something that I would consider to be my own personal taste, but, um, I Stole the One Ring said, made it a suggestion as a book of the month that I thought, you know what, let's try one that isn't from me. Um, and so uh, I put that out as uh, the book of the month, and I read it, and I finished it probably in about a week. Um, Temple's screen keeps freezing. Um, maybe try refreshing, hopefully. I don't know if anybody else is having problems like that. Um, so, yeah, I've... Uh, I read this book, uh, finished it in about a week, and I have to say, I absolutely loved it. It was a delightful book. It was a delightful read. Like it was, it was engrossing. It was funny. It was serious. It was enlightening. <clears throat> it was this fantastic window into uh, the world of uh, large atom, large animal veterinary prob veterinary uh, medicine which of course is not something that i have any personal particular interest in but <clears throat> what made this one so interesting was um uh you see everything from the perspective of uh the the writer james harriet which um is not his real name i should point out i've been i was doing a little research this weekend um, James Harriet is actually a pen name, and his real name is, if I can bring it up here, his real name is James Alfred White, also known just simply as Alf White. Um, and so all of the characters are also fictionalized, but, um, but based on real people. Yes, <laughs> Rachel is saying she hates his real name, Alfie. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, I, and apparently the name James Harriet is uh, named after um, a football player that he just happened to be watching when he wanted to come up with a pen name. So uh, so that's where that came from. And uh, so just a little uh, background on this book. Uh, it's not... Um, it doesn't really have like a straight plot um, as far as... Um, uh, Temple is saying, I was disappointed when I found out that Harriet wasn't his real name. There is a Harriet branch in my family tree. <clears throat> yes. So, um, so yeah, this, and also it should be pointed out, this is, uh, actually a compilation of two smaller books that he wrote, 
uh, I can bring up the titles here. Uh, the two smaller books that he wrote were actually called If Only They Could Talk and It Shouldn't Happen to a Vet, which are both of those two books combined make, make up uh, All Creatures Great and Small. And apparently that was done uh, two more times with four more books. Uh, and uh, the sequels are called All Things Bright and Beautiful and All Things Wise and Wonderful. And uh, from what I understand, it goes all the way through to him uh, joining uh, the Royal Air Force in World War II. So I'd be curious to check that out. Excuse me. So yeah, I never, uh, I never read um, this before. Um, oh yeah, fun, a funny little thing that I picked up about uh, the title, um, "All Creatures Great and Small," uh, which uh, Rachel is uh, correct in pointing out. It is part of a, a hymn called called uh, "All Things Bright and Beautiful," but uh, uh, the uh, Harriet's daughter or White's daughter, if you want to be more accurate um joke that it should actually be called ill creatures great and small um so i thought that was a that that was a cute little uh joke <laughs> uh because of course the uh the main crux of it is um uh ill animals and uh large animal veterinary medicine what is the lady of the king saying there I love this book as a child. I was in 4-H and lived on a farm and had a horse. It was my wonder years. This book made me want to be a vet, but then I realized how much blood and guts were involved, and I knew that it was not the job for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I, I was actually, I have to say, a little shocked when I first uh, started reading this and just reading how the graphic details um of all the uh, all the procedures that he was doing and i mean it didn't put me off or anything like that it didn't like upset me i just wasn't expecting it and so i was a little shocked at first but i i also found that kind of engrossing um not gross outing i guess that's not even really a word um <clears throat> uh yeah uh, everybody is saying how they wanted to be a vet. <laughs> yeah, yeah. When I when the the book opens with a scene with uh, James Harriet basically uh, elbow deep inside a cow, I believe, um, and that was uh, when when that when that that when it opened with that scene, I was like, okay, I'm I'm in for something interesting here, because um, yeah, for. For some reason, um, I know a lot of people uh, grew up reading these books. It never really crossed my path. I mean, I knew of it. I had heard the title, and um, and it was also made into a movie and a TV series. And I actually watched a couple episodes of uh, the TV series um, just to sort of have that reference. And once, when I turned it on, it, the whole thing is on Netflix. It's a uh, seven seasons, I think. Um, as soon as I turned it on and the theme song started, I was like, I recognize this. I have heard this before. So clearly it was playing at some point in my life. It just never really, like, uh, stuck with me. But but having read the book now, it's, it's really fascinating. And I'm really into it. Um... Uh, Aravandi is saying the animal medical stuff doesn't gross me out to read or watch, but I just couldn't do it myself. Um, and Rachel is saying the series was genius, but I don't like some of their casting. Now, I, don't, I only watched a couple episodes, um, so uh, I really can't speak too much to the casting overall. I was kind of uh, surprised that um, uh, the, the actor playing... Um, uh, the character of uh, Siegfried uh, Farnham is uh, the same man who played uh, Cornelius Fudge in the uh, Harry Potter movies. Um, little interesting, little bit of trivia there. And then, of course, uh, the actor who plays uh, Tristan Farnham, who is his uh, his younger uh, brother, 
uh, was played by Peter Davison, um, who was uh, the Doctor in Doctor Who. He was the fifth Doctor, and that's what he's best known for. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot going on in the chat here. I think... I think when you go through training, you become desensitized to the blood and guts after a while. Well, it's either it's either you become desensitized to it, or you realize that you just can't handle it and you have to drop out. Um, it's kind of one or the other, and that's kind of why I that that's why I feel like they they give you so much practical experience uh, in school to make sure that you have what it takes to do it. Because yeah. The, there is a lot going on that I probably would not be able to stomach very well. Um, and there were even a couple of shots in uh, the show that sort of took me aback. Like, uh, uh, okay, um, I don't think I'd be able to do that. <laughs> um, but I, I should uh, point out that this is not like a straight... Um, this is not a... This doesn't have the same kind of story structure that um, you might be used to in a novel because it doesn't have like a solid beginning, middle, and end and a through line. It's more a collection of vignettes over the course of a few years. I think uh, I think it was two years. Um, let's see. Hope Rachel's saying hopefully you realize you can handle it before applying to vet school. It's extremely difficult to become a vet. Um, and Light of the King is saying, I think what I like most about his writing is his honesty with his feelings and how he describes the character's experience just so British and lovely. And, and that's true. And it was like, it's an interesting um, window into that world because he is so matter of fact in his uh, narrative voice, which I do really like. Um, but it's also taking a look at this very this very interesting sort of transitional period um, in the 1930s, especially in the uh, in the rural areas where um, all all the farming techniques that were basically being used with uh, cows and horses and various beasts of burden were now being replaced by uh, machinery um, and also um, and and also how um, antibiotics were becoming uh, more of a thing in medicine, or more of a common practice in medicine, and it was uh, it was removing all of these more rural um, remedies that people have been using for years and decades and centuries, and was sort of the agreed upon. This is how you heal these animals techniques, and now these vets were coming in with all of these other seemingly magical medicines that were doing way better and so it was this interesting transition um, and you got to see that from the perspective of both the vet and the farmer and uh, and one of the things that I liked uh, is uh, the character of Siegfried who is uh, the vet that uh, James Harriet is working for um, who is a very interesting man um he was he was talking about how he would mix different things to uh sort of add a little bit of theatricality to his treatments uh just to sort of give just to just to wow the farmers into thinking they're doing something really amazing rather than just like injecting something and boom they're fixed like he would just he would just do little things and i like that um and Rachel is saying Siegfried is intolerable. I always want to punch him, but I still like him. And that that is exactly my assessment of him too. Um, I I should we should talk a little bit about Siegfried um, because he's he's one of the more interesting and infuriating characters I've ever read um, because he is a he's a man who will say who will tell. He tells James one thing at one minute, and then five minutes later, he will admonish him for doing that exact thing, and and it, it's infuriating. Like I, there was one point, like, and I I kind of like that he saved this for the end of this book when uh, James finally just loses it on him, and and you know losing it in the British sense, which definitely is not all of the 
is not the same as like here where he basically just says listen I've had enough <laughs> and and uh, Siegfried even then like is not willing to admit that he does this um and like you sort of have to wonder like if there is something wrong with his brain but he's also such a good vet that like you just sort of you sort of just had to accept this eccentricity of his and but at the same time like it would drive me nuts it would drive me absolutely nuts <laughs> um so light of the king is saying i spent about a month in yorkshire and I just love that whole area and people. The way they talk is lyrical, and Yorkshire tea and goodies are the best. Uh, having never been to Yorkshire, I'll have to take your word for that. But um, I do love um, the way um, all the locals speak in the book. Um, yeah, Rachel is saying, Siegfried isn't mean-spirited, he's just annoying as hell. And... Yeah, he absolutely is. Um, but at the same time, he is a good mentor. Like, for as infuriating as he is, he he gets the job done. And for the most part, he is very fair with James. Like, aside from various other things. I sort of feel like uh, this, uh, this other character whose name is escaping me, the woman that um, about halfway through Siegfried hires as, um, as an accountant or somebody to help keep his books uh, since he is absolutely horrible at bookkeeping and like he really has no patience with her and it it almost felt like every every chance he had to make her look like a fool he would take and that was um, that was a little that was a little harder to take because she was working very hard to try to rein in the finances of this man who up until that point had been keeping all of his money in a, like like a coffee jar <laughs> um, and just grabbing what he needed when he needed it and not keeping records of it at all and and so she was like she was getting very upset with him and Harbottle was her, was her name thank you um, and you're right Tip Temple was a very hobbity name um, and Temple is saying, uh, I think it's a control thing. He's the oldest in the family. He probably feels the need to assert it, assert himself. And that's true. Um, but uh, I, th I think, so, uh, what is Light of the King saying? I thought it was so funny how he kept telling Tristan he was sacked, but then he would relent. It's like he just had to explode in anger, then he was okay an hour later. Yeah, and that was that was funny. Um, and like I, I really like that first scene when we meet Tristan and Siegfried like immediately blows up at him and tells him he's fired, clear out, go find another job and and James of course is mortified by this because he's never seen this before. He's like, what did I just walk into? And and then Tristan says, oh don't worry, he does this he does this like once a month. <laughs> He'll be fine. And uh, and Rachel is saying Tristan is just as bad in opposite ways. Yeah, he um, Tristan uh, is another interesting character because he really is like he's he's fairly irresponsible, but he's also somebody who like after after time you sort of realize he is trying, he is trying to be more responsible. It's just not in his nature, and he doesn't know how to do it. Um, uh, what is Romander saying the more you talk about this the more it reminds me of a series I used to watch as a kid has it been adapted to a television series at some point it has um, it, was a, it was a BBC series and, and it was also called All Creatures Great and Small that ran from uh, 78 to off and on until about 1990 um, um, Rachel says uh, you can appreciate that Tristan and Siegfried have their own roles in their weird brother dynamic yes they definitely have a very weird brother dynamic um almost to the point where it would be very uncomfortable for a third party and that's sort of where we see james 
in in all of this. Like you can tell throughout the course of the book, he's never quite comfortable with the relationship between Siegfried and Tristan. Um, but he just sort of puts up with it. But you can tell, like, whenever like the two of them come to blows, he tenses up and doesn't really want to be a part of it. Like he's he's always sort of slowly backing away. Um, what is Temple saying here? I think Tristan is smart, but with an older brother who is so controlling, he doesn't get to have much agency for himself. I think that's why he goofs off. He's going to get in trouble anyway, so why try? And, you know, that's a good point. Um, and, yeah. And Light of the King is saying, I love how Siegfried and Tristan were named after Wagner characters. That's And that was true, and that was actually like a really uh, funny exchange. Uh, between um, between Siegfried and uh, James, where Siegfried tells him their father was a big fan of Wagner, um, and 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 James just says, "Well, it could have been worse. You could have been named." And he pulls out like some like really weird esoteric name from uh, the Ring Cycle, and and Siegfried is like, "You know, that's a good point." <laughs> And I apologize, I can't remember that name that he used, but I remember I, I remember reading that bit and just laughing because it was so hilarious. It was so ridiculous. And and that's what uh what I really like about this is that it is it's a very human story. It's a very relatable um, collection of characters and it's a very relatable collection of um, scenarios. And one of the things that really like spoke to me um, just in a general sense, um, is this idea of, um, there's a, there's a scene toward, towards the beginning, um, where James is called out to, um, a big estate, a lordly estate, and he is basically confronted by, um, the, by the guy who runs the stables, um, and he comes off very haughty and he's telling him that I don't trust you and he's telling him you're doing things wrong and he's just criticizing him and he's putting him down and then and it finally gets to the point where um, uh, it, it finally gets to the point where James realizes that this horse who he's been called in to examine is in fact dying and is in agony and there's nothing he can do about it and he has to put him down and and the the man in question who is berating him this whole time his name is uh, Soames and he is telling him well this isn't how Siegfried would handle this and this isn't this isn't how anybody else would handle this i doubt you i really don't think you know what you're doing and and ultimately James has to uh put this horse down and he does and Soames is furious and he's screaming at him i'm going to sue you and we're going to we have to bring Siegfried in tomorrow to do a post mortem, and he will prove that you are that you were wrong, and I will sue you, and I will make sure you never work again, and and like that whole scene, and there were lots of other scenes where he's dealing with uh, lots of farmers who are very much questioning his credentials and his knowledge and. Um, whether or not he has any real experience like throughout um and they're not all like that but there were a number who were like that who just they don't trust him they think they know better than him and this was something that i um i think a lot of us uh in in any sort of service type of industry encounter and i think that that's very relatable um, for myself, uh, working in uh, the DVD and Blu-ray industry, which I realize is nothing like veterinary medicine in any way whatsoever, except um, that, like James, I have to deal with people who really don't know what they're talking about, but think they do, and who are in a position to intimidate. And that that's something that you sort of feel that I think most of us can relate to who have worked at any point in our lives have had to deal with situations like that. Um, 
And so I found that that was very relatable. And just to cap off that little vignette, ultimately Siegfried does come in, does the postmortem, and finds out that James was correct. And then it comes out later that Soames has actually been sort of defrauding the Lord. And so he gets fired and um, basically becomes destitute. So you know what? Karma. <laughs> Uh, and Rachel is saying I prefer the big farmers to the rich ladies and their stupid little dogs <laughs> yeah that was another one and again because I'm absolutely terrible with remembering character names there was that one woman who uh, keeps calling James in to check up on her dog and then at some point she actually gets a pig and And yeah, she was she was funny. I liked her. Like she was harmless, she was just weird. <laughs> um so but that's the one thing that I really liked about this book is like there are all these different characters and they're very colorful characters. Colorful characters. Um and they're they're funny to read. They're funny to think about. Um, uh, it's funny seeing James's reaction to them, especially in the beginning when he's still not used to this, um, and he's just very awkward and unsure of how to proceed. Especially um, like one of the thing, another scene in. Again, this is towards the beginning. Uh, it's his first night in town. Um, he's just been offered the job by Siegfried, and they go to celebrate in a pub. And and uh, Rachel says, "Remember, he's Scottish." Yes. <laughs> um. So they they go to celebrate in a pub, and um, all the farmers are there. They're all getting um. Is that Tricky Woo? Yes. Oh, Tricky Woo. Yes. Now I remember Tricky Woo. Um, I think. Yeah. There, there were so many stories, and I have to, I have to tell you that, like, I read this at the beginning of the month, um, so I'm having a hard time remembering all of it. Um, I'm just remembering bits and pieces here and there. But I was talk. Um, one of the scenes that I was talking about was this uh, scene where. Um, Siegfried and James are celebrating uh, the new hire at a pub and all the local farmers are there and they're all drinking and carrying on and then it eventually gets out that James is a uh, excuse me James is uh, the new assistant to the vet and suddenly all these farmers start questioning him and my favorite scene is this old guy takes him aside and says listen I know the cure for this one specific disease and and he, and James just plays along with him he's like I'm gonna tell you it but you can't tell anybody it's marshmallow cream and, and he handles it so well with this guy who is like like clearly like he believes it but it's so not real and and then he talks to Siegfried about it, and he's like, oh yeah, he told me the same thing. <laughs> and so, like, this is... I just thought that was such a cute, funny little scene, and I love the way that James just sort of handled it and just went with it. Because um, it could have gone the other way. Like, he he could have been haughty and said, well, th you're, you're talking nonsense, and there's no way that could work, and really sort of ruined his reputation right out of the gate. Um, but I, I love like little scenes like that. I loved all the farmer characters, um, cause there was like this mix of, um, concern, frugality, um, this very, this very strong sense of uncertainty, particularly, uh, when it came to uh, the future of their own farms. Um, like, of course, a lot of them are talking about, uh, money, um, because they're all they're they're not making a, a ton of money on their farms and so they're very frugal and then there's also um, this whole 
this whole I, this whole uncertainty of where are they going to be um, farm life is changing everything's becoming more mechanized are they going to be able to keep up with the times and and he and he has he really has sympathy with them and and I had sympathy with them uh, because it, it was it like when you look at it from that you realize just this was a very uncertain time for them like they didn't know um, if these farms which had been their livelihoods for generations were gonna last another 10 years um, and so seeing that was actually like uh, very eye-opening. It was not something I would have thought of, but um, but it really like it it got to me. And uh, so, so like the main characters in this are of course uh, James, Siegfried, and Tristan, and then there's Helen, who sort of comes in like a little over halfway through, maybe maybe about three quarters of the way through this book. And she will ultimately uh, become James's wife, and she doesn't really play much of a part in it until like the very end when he he really starts courting her because there's like this whole like is she interested? Isn't she interested? Um, uh, part of it. Um, okay, Light of the King is back. Uh, and uh, Rachel is saying the way Harriet describes himself, you really can't believe Helen falls in love with him. And yeah, that's that's sort of like that was my assessment of it too, because there was like this this very awkward uh, period between them, where like he would take her out on a date, and it would end in utter disaster. And so she would go away. She'd be like, "Okay, I don't want to deal with you." And then like many months later. Um, she would he'd try again and she'd be like okay let's try again and again something awful would happen and and so um, so and so like it, w it was like this sort of like this failed attempt to court this f another failed attempt to court her and then eventually like he sort of gives up um and then, for whatever reason, tries tries again, and this time things seem to work out. But um, let's see what is Temple saying here. For all the simplicity of each vignette, it's very easy to feel compassion for most, if not all, the characters in the book. And I absolutely agree. Um, uh, that I think that that is what definitely helps with the storytelling in this is that um, the stories, all these little vignettes, they're all very simple. The characters themselves are very simple. They're easy to identify. They're easy to sympathize with. Um, and so Temple also says, I think James convinced himself that Helen wasn't interested in dating him because he was so awkward. It didn't seem like Helen felt that way about him at all. And that was sort of my takeaway from it. Um, I agree, Temple. Because, um, of course, this is all written from uh, his perspective. And so what we see from his perspective is, I have failed, there's no way she could be interested in me. Um, I am just awkward, I'm dorky, I'm awful. Um, and, she, and she is this wondrous beauty, and there is no way that she could possibly be interested in somebody like me. And yet, she keeps coming back to him. So clearly there must be some sort of interest there. Um, Light of the King says, I was upset by when he was working with Greer and he told him the wrong methods and the pig got worse. Just makes you wonder what people in medical fields are influenced by. Yeah. Um, and But you know what, Light of the King? I'm actually glad that that story was in there um, because it also shows that uh, vets are not superhuman. They're not... They don't know everything. They will make mistakes. And that was, like, for most of the vignettes, like, it sort of seemed like most of them had a happy ending, or at least, if not a happy ending, an ending where James was right. Um, and so it was, it was nice to, it was, it was a nice change of pace to read a story where he actually was wrong. And, and to see uh, the consequences of that, particularly in his own head. Um, 
Uh, Rachel says, Harriet writes about vets being given, sold new drugs, new tools, and we get to see how they fail utterly. And, and yeah, it's all these different, um, the, like this was, like I said, it's a, it was a transitory uh, time uh, in medicine um, because they were going into antibiotics, um, which was a very uh, different... Um, which was a very different uh, type of medicine. Um, Temple says, yeah, that bothered me too, but there can be a lot of egocentric people in medicine and like to take credit for something they didn't do. Um, um, and and that's true. And uh, that was another thing that... Um, and again, I don't know whether or not this is true, but um, according to um, James Harriet's uh, son, uh, the real son, um, most of the vignettes in these uh, in these books uh, were not actually um, firsthand stories from his own history, but um, stuff that he witnessed um, as as a vet in the '60s and '70s that he just uh, put into this time period because that was when he was writing these books. Um, Aravandi says, "I seriously need to get this book, but I'm happy listening to the discussion for now." Well, I'm glad you're enjoying the discussion. I hope that it's not um, so esoteric that you can't follow it. Um, Lady of the King says, I loved how he was, a, he was a Scot who fell in love with the Dales. For anyone who has walked the moors, they would understand. And I never have. Um, but um, it, uh, he, he was very good at describing it. And it certainly... Uh, it certainly got me interested. I mean, I've always wanted to visit England, so that's nothing new. But now I want to check out the Moors. Uh, I want to check out Yorkshire. And, um, like, that that was something that I really liked uh, was you would sort of have these moments uh, where um, he would just sort of take a step back and just appreciate um, the place where he is and... And it was in those moments that, like, you could tell he was just so taken with it. Like, it got me into it. I was like, I, I want to visit this place now. I want to see what this is like. Because, um, I mean, I, I grew up uh, in in a more of a suburban area, but I was also about 10 miles away from where it becomes very rural and uh, lots of farmland. And I would usually uh, go there and visit there, and um, it is, it's, it's just, it's a beautiful, a, a beautiful world. Um, and it's a very different paced kind of world from uh, what we're used to. Um, uh, Light of the King says, chapter 36, paragraph 3, has a great description. Um, I don't have it on my Kindle, um, so I can't bring it up. Um, so I will take your word for that, and even if I did, it would, um, yeah. But, uh, yeah, I, I can believe it. There were lots of great descriptions in there. Um, so, uh, yeah. So, um, I talked a little bit about, um, the TV show, um, and... And the movie, which I haven't watched, although apparently in the movie, um, Siegfried is played by Anthony Hopkins, which I find highly intriguing. Um, I definitely want to check that out. Um, uh, but I, I did like, uh, I liked what I saw of uh, the TV series uh, so far, and from what I could tell, it was being very accurate to the book. Like, um, every scene that was happening... I remembered reading and and I remember reading from three weeks ago so that was good and it was very engrossing like I mean it was it was definitely slower paced like uh, you would expect from a BBC a BBC show from the 70s but not to the point where like you felt bored by it or at least I didn't feel bored by it like I was still interested I was I, I was taken in by these uh, by these characters um, and and like I've said before, one of the things that makes these characters so interesting is just how, or one of the things that makes these characters so fun is just how relatable they really are. And like, 
And like, yeah, there are vets in England in the 30s. You would think it's as far removed from anything that you could possibly be. But at the same time, they are very relatable people. Like there, there is this element of the human condition that is very universal. And you see that in in these characters and you see that in these situations like um, I stole the one rings is saying I have to check out the TV series um, I I would uh, they're they're all available on Netflix um, so you can check them out that way uh, light of the king has brought up the uh, the phrase but today the endless patchwork of fields slumbered in the Sun and the air even on the hill was even on the hill was heavy with sense of summer there must be people working among the farms down there yeah yeah they're they're like great great bits of a uh, description like that uh, great bits of like uh, I think uh, Rachel called it a figurative language which it absolutely is um, and that's that's sort of one of the things that draws you in is like like his love for this um, uh, Remainder says, "Sounds like where, where I grew up at my foster parents. Cool." Um, and Rachel says he was a great author and a great vet, and he was just great. And based on these books, I would have to agree. Like he was a, he was somebody who, like, it was very clear from reading this book that this was his passion, and. <laughs> Rachel is saying I can pull out more English lit terms I know you can <laughs> um, but yeah like what I the big takeaway that I got from this book was that this was a man who was passionate about this this wasn't just a job to him this was a life to him um, like and and like I, w I would put it past job I would put it past career like this was his life and and it and it was a good life it was a satisfying life like um, there were hardships there were certainly things that drove him crazy but you never got the sense that he didn't love it and that's sort of what I what kept me going with this book was just like this this deep passion and love for this uh, for this work that he was doing and and you don't get that um, unless you you feel it for yourself like unless the author himself believes that and and light of the king says all these things were happening while tolkien was writing the hobbit and lord of the rings this is true um uh rachel is saying i can't even tell you how much these books meant to me as a kid slash adolescent um yeah i I could see how um, how books like these would really grab somebody, especially um, a younger person, because the language is simple, uh, the characters are simple, um, they're easy to relate to. Um, what did I do here? Yeah, they're they're engrossing at the same time. The whole thing is fascinating, and more than anything else the love just just comes off of the page the passion just comes off of the page in these books or at least in in this book i would assume it it's the same in the others um which at some point i'm going to have to read um lot i found that a lot of these books of the month that we've been doing uh are usually the first book in a series and I don't mind that, but now like I have all of these sequels that are on my to read list. <laughs> so I've got plenty of stuff to to read for many years to come. Um, uh, Light of the King says I loved when he had to go out twice in one night and didn't want to get dressed a second time, so he wore his pajamas out and then ended up at that lorry stop with all the lorry drivers looking at him. Yeah. Yeah, that was a that was a funny one, and I think that was also the situation where he didn't have his wallet with him, so he couldn't pay for a uh, for the meal he was about to eat, and and basically everybody thought he was just like some vagrant off the street. 
Um, and Rachel is saying, I highly recommend continuing this series. I have every intention of continuing this series. Um, uh, Temple is saying, I'm having I'm having the sequel issue too. Plus, I'm still trying to make my way through Game of Thrones. That is that is tough. That is a big read. Um, you have you really have to set aside a lot of time for uh, the Song of Ice and Fire series. Um, but yeah, like I still haven't read um, this either of the sequels to uh, The Strain. Um, I've I have read all of the uh, David Eddings books, um, so that's that's fine. But you know, like that's just one. Like I still need to read uh, the Strain, the other Strain books. I want to read the rest of this series. Um, uh, there there are others that I can't remember, but I think like in the future I'm gonna try to see if I can put more standalone books in in a uh, the book of the month uh just so that we can so that we don't have this like sequel issue where suddenly what turned into just like one book has now become three that we're desperate to read uh rachel says the strain was meh um i like a i i like the strain um the the series the tv series i'm kind of on it right now but um Let's see. Uh, what is Rachel saying here? I want to say that it was that it really was the James Harriet books that solidified me as an Anglophile. I can absolutely see that, uh, Rachel. Um, I um, there there is something about that that um, sort of draws you into that culture in a way that many other stories don't, or or at least didn't for me. Um, Uh, is that correct that Harriet's stories were happening while Tolkien was writing uh, The Hobbit and LOTR time frame? Well, actually, um, that was something that I brought up briefly. Um, according to uh, Harriet's son, um, a lot of the stories are, are more fictionalized um, and are more based on cases that, um, that he witnessed um, uh, in the 60s and 70s when he was uh, writing the books. Um, and sort of incorporated them into that time frame. So it actually is um, a lot more fictionalized than um, him, than his firsthand uh, memories because uh, they were older. Um, but yeah, that that's what I heard. So it is it is a. It's not quite as autobiographical as I think many are led to believe. Um. But again, I can't confirm that. Um, uh, let's see what's going on here. Rachel, have you ever been to England? Yes, she has. I think I'm like probably the only person here who hasn't been to England. Um, and Aravandi is saying, I'm making my way through the Silmarillion. I have plenty of reading material to keep me busy for a while. Yes. <laughs> This is quite true. There is, uh, there's plenty to keep us busy, and uh, since we're on the subject of stuff to read, why don't I talk about what our next uh, book of the month is going to be? Um, since this is uh, the last day of August, uh, tomorrow is the first. Um, what is Temple saying there? But I'm sure that since he lived at the same time, even the books were written a few decades later, he probably captured the sense of the time in his writing. Oh, he absolutely did. Um, uh, I mean, just because like it's not fully autobiographical doesn't mean that it's it's not untrue, or that that doesn't mean that it's not true. Because um, it it certainly felt quite authentic to me. Um, so now everybody's talking about all the different places in England they've been to. Thanks, guys. <laughs> I really appreciate it. <laughs> um, so uh, let, let's uh, bring up um, the book of the month for September. Uh, September is, of course, back to school month. And so we're going to be focusing on books we might have read in school, which uh, I think we sort of got a... 
a handle on with uh, all creatures great and small since it seems a lot of us uh, read this um, when they were kids or when they were younger um, so I've chosen uh, a book that is a uh, pretty um, pretty solid uh, school reading like it's definitely on the list of uh, uh, books that you read in school now although it did come out a little bit after my time so I never got to read it um, but I um, I'm reading it now and also it's a uh, uh, Rachel is saying I have to teach catcher in the rye four times every year now Ugh. Oof, I don't I don't uh, envy you there Rachel <laughs> um, so um, so this book um, was a little after my time so I never read it in school and it's also uh, kind of in in the more public eye now because a movie based on it uh, just recently came out and so for September the book that we are reading will the book that we'll be reading is The Giver by Lois Lowry um, and I don't know how many of you have read this I would assume at least a few of you have already if you haven't it's a quick read uh, it's not a difficult read um, The Gibver. <laughs> I don't understand that. Did I say the Gibver? It's the Giver. Um, it's a very easy book to find. Um, it and yeah, it's a quick read. Uh, uh, it's a uh, the. Aravandia says, is that the book that the movie The Giver is based on? Yes, it is. Uh, it just came out um, a couple weeks ago. And Rachel is saying, I guess before you said it, the chat is lagging. Okay, fair enough. Okay, you guessed it. <laughs> You're good, Rachel. <laughs> uh, I haven't... Light of the King says, I haven't seen the movie yet, never read the book as a child. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I only just recently read it. Um, and yeah, it's a very quick read. Um, I thought it was, uh, I thought it was very fascinating. Um, I haven't seen the movie, uh, from what I can tell from the trailers, it looks like the movie is changing a lot. Um, um, so, uh, but I, I might just for the sake of it, check it out at some point. Uh, it didn't do very well, so it's probably going to leave theaters pretty soon. Um, is it even a hundred pages? Rachel is asking. I, it probably is, like probably like a little over a hundred, but not much. Um, it's not, it's not a big book. It's not a long book. Um, I think it's a very interesting book. Uh, I think it's uh, quite fascinating. Um, I enjoyed it. Uh, I think you will too. And uh, so we're also uh, this month going to be talking about. Um, the books we read in school, uh, the ones that we liked, the ones that we didn't like. Um, uh, there are certainly uh, some some stories that we read um, that I was not a big fan of, and others that utterly changed my life. Um, let's see. I stole the one ring. Is asking what is this book about? Um, without going into too many details, it's um, about a future world where everything is very homogeneous um, everybody is the same um, there are strict rules um, everybody lives in peace and there is this kid who was given a specific job which is to basically hold all the memories of humanity so that all the rest of the people in this society don't have to have them and don't have to have the emotional weight of them and so the story is about um, the previous person who was holding these memories transferring them to him and and what all that entails and so it's it's a very interesting uh, concept um, uh, yes Rachel is saying people are assigned jobs at adolescence some become breeders yes uh, the birth mothers 
Um, but I don't want to get into uh, too many details. Uh, I'd like you to read it. Um, uh, Rachel saying Jeff Bridges is awesome, but too young. I I agree and disagree. Like I sort of feel like he ages up very well, but I agree um, for for what uh, that character has gone through in the book. I sort of expect somebody to be much more haggard. Like I mean. Like you sort of expect somebody like what you see on the cover here, like this very, this very old, haggard, broken down old man, and as good as Jeff Bridges is, uh, I I don't think he's quite there. But I mean, like I said, I haven't seen the movie, so I really can't comment. Um, I do sort of feel like no matter what he does these days, he's always sort of embodying uh, that character. His character, the dude from uh, *The Big Lebowski*, so part of me is kind of like looking forward to and also dreading uh, what he does. Um, and so I'll be posting uh, links to this on the Facebook page and on Twitter. Um, it's a very easy book to find, particularly uh, this month since uh, most uh, bookstores are pushing um, school reading now with uh, *Back to School*. And it's uh, it's usually featured very prominently in those sections, and probably even more so now that it's uh, just been made into a movie. So, so yeah, that's uh, that's that. Um, there, there really isn't uh, too much more I can think to say about um, all creatures great and small. Um, this was definitely not the kind of book that I personally would have just picked up on a whim. Uh, it's not something that I would have like gone out of my way to read. It's something that I knew about. Um, but having read it, um, it I was absolutely enchanted by it. Like this was a this was a thoroughly delightful book for me. And I I adored it, and I definitely want to read the rest in the series. Um, and and I was uh, very uh, glad to see like just just how strong a reaction it got when I announced this. Like this is clearly a very beloved book by a lot of people. Um, and I stole the one ring of saying, "Ooh, I can get it for free!" Oh, bonus. <laughs> Um, uh, talking about the giver, I guess. Um, so I I thought that this was um, it's it's a fascinating book, it's an engrossing book, uh, just delightfully well written and uh, easy to uh, and easy to pick up, easy to read. Um, uh. But I, I really just absolutely, I absolutely love this book, and I want to read the rest. And I am definitely a James Harriet fan. I'm not about to uh, change uh, careers and enter a career in a uh, in veterinary medicine. Uh, I would not go that far. But um, I still thought that as um, as a story, it really uh, it really brought me in, and. I, I was absolutely enchanted by it, and I can see that a lot of you were too. Um, and uh, I stole the one ring and saying I'm glad that this book was well received and a lot of people enjoyed it, including you. Um, and yes, thank you. I stole the one ring for suggesting this. Um, it was it it was very well received. Uh, like I said, uh, uh, the announcement for this. For this one is the book of the month got probably one of the most enthusiastic responses of any any book of the month announcement I've made so far um, and and I loved it and clearly everybody else loved it <laughs> and Light of the King saying I was so glad that it was the book of the month it was like a birthday present from the torn book club <laughs> well I'm glad uh, I'm glad that you uh, you took it that way um, and so I need to um, I need to read the others and 
Rachel is saying, I want to help sheep during lambing season still. I hear you. I really hear you. Like, that was that was a hard bit to get through. Like, I wanted to, I wanted to help out, too. Um, and so, um, so that's going to bring us uh, to the end of, uh, of this, uh, of this episode. It's a little bit shorter. We usually go about 90 minutes, but it's just me this time. So I figure we'll keep it to a little bit, a little over an hour. Um, but thank you again. Um, I stole the one ring for this fantastic suggestion. Uh, All Creatures Great and Small was a wonderful book that I'm really glad that I read. Um, I'm probably going to watch a little bit more of the TV series too. Um, uh, what is that? Oh, be amazing. We had sheep there, cute, but incorrigible. Yes. <laughs> certainly seems that way um but um so yeah that'll bring us uh, to the end for uh for this week um so yeah so um i want to thank you all for uh being a part of uh this show and for uh being uh, such a lively chat and um and for for participating in a discussion for enjoying uh, this book and and as always thank you for coming back uh, every week um, we have a couple couple of our regulars weren't here this week uh, Jan and uh, Ava Ava I know is uh, in uh, Atlanta right now for Dragon Con so she's a little busy uh, Jan um, Jan has a lot of stuff going on so uh, And Ravandir is saying, not so lively from my side today, sorry. Well, that's not your fault. <laughs> um, uh, Temple says, uh, I know I'll have a lot to say for next month. The Giver is one of my favorite books. Uh, I would uh, I would understand that. It was a, it was a good book. I, I had never read it before, uh, before now. Um, and so, yeah. Uh, Jan has uh, school stuff to deal with, so um, so for next week, uh, let's uh, let's talk about uh, some of our some of our favorite books that we read in school and some of the ones that we didn't like so much. Uh, I'll be compiling a list of my own. I'd love for you to compile your own lists because um, I think uh, there are a number of us who come from uh, different um, backgrounds and different uh, time periods of schooling. So what? what one person read in school is probably not um, the same as uh, the other one. Um, the name is Aeon Wei. I've said nothing but was listening intently. Thanks for the show. Well, thank you. Thank you, Aeon Wei, for uh, chiming in. Um, so, so yeah. Um, so for next week, uh, let's Let's uh, talk about uh, some of the uh, some of the, some of our favorite books from school. Some of the ones that we didn't like so much. Um, and uh, thank you again. I stole the one ring for this uh, suggestion, and I think I'm going to start opening up a uh, book of the month suggestions to uh, to more of you out there who might have uh, some thoughts. Um, just so that it's not all me. <laughs> um, but for now, um, September's book of the month is The Giver. And, and so that will bring us to the end. And uh, Light of the King is asking, hope you're off for Labor Day. I am not. Um, I will be going into work tomorrow. Um, uh, Temple made a suggestion a few months back and you never got back to me. Uh, I have to uh, check. Did you email me or did you Facebook me? Um, I'll I'll check both um, because I would I'll I'll see what your uh, suggestions were. Um, so yeah, that's gonna be it for me. Uh, that's gonna be it for the show for this week, and and I will see you all next week. 
and never stop reading. <laughs>